next up I would like to uh, discuss absolute frequency measurement of light and how you go about doing this. So we need an optical rule and we have already discussed the, the kind of laser which can be used for this optical ruler. And this is, this is the so-called mode locked laser, which we discussed before, where you have many modes oscillating inside uh, optical cavity at the same time, and they are all locked together with, with each other by face locking them together. So they are referred to each other. So here I have another picture of these different modes, and if I look at these different modes, so there's the first mode, second one, third one, and so on and so forth, and the distance between these, they are all equidistant. So if we look in the frequency plane, we have equidistant mode and they are the distance between them, uh, delta nu, is c over 2l, so where this is the length of the cavity. But since we also need to have amplification of our laser, uh, the laser amplification crystal or whatever kind of laser we are using have to work where the modes are I and mean, it doesn't work down to zero frequency, so that means the gain medium only works within a certain bandwidth and that means that we will only have gain for these modes here so the laser will actually only uh, work over this range. But over this range we have equally spaced optical modes uh, which could potentially be used uh, for a for, as an optical ruler. And just like a quick uh, recap, for this to work we can't have random faces, so we have to lock them to each other. And we, we talked about earlier on the last lecture how to use this. With, you do lock all of these modes to each other uh, with a Kerr media, where the losses are low for pulses inside the cavity. Okay, so you remember we had a, we had a pulse bouncing forward and back inside the cavity like we see here. And every time it hits the mirror on one side, we get a pulse coming out, uh, out of the cavity. And the frequency of which we get these pulses coming out is exactly the frequency separation between the different modes inside the cavity. So it's one over this frequency distance. It's the time separation between the pulses coming out. So we can just simply put a photodiode outside the cavity measuring so if we now look at our spectrum and we want to measure the repetition rate, so the distance between these modes, this we can just simply measure with a photodiode outside the cavity. But if we now remember that they, we didn't lace down to the zero frequency here, and deciding how many, how many of these f rep separation varies uh, down to zero is not very difficult because this separation is typically 50 megahertz or so and measuring in a frequency There's lots of other method which allows you to measure the frequency of light within 50 megahertz or better the problem isn't that the problem is that due to nonlinearities higher order nonlinearities in the cavity the the uh, f zero I mean if we extend this down to zero this frequency is not zero so that mean this mode doesn't exist, but if we just extend them down here, there's a difference frequency between the mode which would be here and zero frequency. So we'll, let's just call us this F0. And we don't know what this F0 is, and, it, and this can also vary over time. So if we want to know the frequency of the nth mode up here, we know we can easily work out what n is, we know what F rep is, but we don't know what F0 is. So the trick now is to try and work out what is F0. And uh, this was realized in, I think it was 2005, and then they got, or, or closely to that, and then they got the Nobel Prize for this. And this was Ted Hench and John Hall who got the Nobel Prize for the optical frequency code. So what they, what they did was they said, well, okay, let's say we have an octave spanning laser. That means we have a laser where we, where if we look at this, uh, uh, this frequency here and this frequency, the frequency here is is twice as high as this frequency over here. That's just me. That's what it means if it spans more than an octave. If we have such a laser, we can take out this frequency here, and the frequency of this is n one times f rep plus f zero, and n one times f rep plus f zero. And then we send this 
through a crystal and do frequency doubling, which like we talked extensively about, then what comes out is of course twice of this here. So now we have 2 times n1 times f rep plus 2 times f0. But if we look at this frequency over here, which is roughly, uh, which is roughly two, twice as high, so or rather it's exactly twice as high, so it's 2 times n1 times f rep plus the same f0, this f0 over here. So if we now take and mix these two, then we will see the, um, just, and mixing, it's just putting them onto a detector, then we will see the difference frequency between these two uh, beat nodes. And if we now take this, uh, this, this one down here, minus this one up here, you see in both of them we have 2 N1 F rep, but here we have 2 F0 and here we have F0. So if we take and look at the difference frequency between these two, which is exactly what we get on this detector, that's F0. So what we will have to do is have an octave spanning laser. And if we have an octave spanning laser, we can easily measure F0 and then we can lock F0 as well. And then we have a frequency comb. We know what F0 is, we can measure it and we can lock it. And we have a frequency comb where each of these, mode, each of these modes over the whole wavelength range of this is locked. Okay, so how do we broaden our frequency spectrum? That we have also talked about earlier. We can use, uh, we can do the same trick as we did in, a, in the supercontinuum source, where we use self phase modulation again in a fiber to broaden the spectrum. So here we have a original spectrum of a laser, and then we broaden it uh, by sending it through this, fi uh, this fiber and, has, and where we have self phase modulation. And now we have a laser which spans from uh, 600 nanometers to 1,600 nanometers, which is more than one, uh, which is more than one octave. I mean, one octave would be from uh, 600 nanometers to uh, 1,200 nanometers. So now we have a laser which is necessary uh, to do this locking. Okay. So now all of these laser modes are, are, are known. We can measure the repetition frequency and we can lock the offset frequency and we can actually lock the repetition frequency as well. So both of these frequency, the whole of this is, is, can be related down to, uh, down to RF frequencies. And, any, and we can now take and beat any of these modes of this laser against the laser we want to measure. And by me measuring a beat frequency, for example, by this, by a, compared to an unknown laser, we can know exactly what frequency this laser has. Since we can measure this so accurately, and there are some lines which are very, very, some optical transitions which are very well defined, a number of years ago, they came up with the idea of using this to define the second eventually. And the second is still defined by a, a transition, but it's an RF transition at 9.2 gigahertz. But if you move to an optical transition, you can, you can uh, increase the precision of clocks and that would be called an optical clock because it used an optical transition. So that means we have some transition which we can measure very accurately, and that gives us an accurate oscillation. And with the laser system we just described, we can actually count the number of os oscillations. Well, we can very accurately measure the number of oscillation, and this allows us to, as I say, have an optical clock. So this, uh, let's look a little bit on a setup like this. So you have, a, in this case, your oscillator is a laser. You use this laser to very, very carefully measure a transition in some material. So the laser light comes out, a little bit goes off. You measure very carefully a transition in some material, which is very well defined. And then you use a frequency comb, a femtosecond laser, so to count the number of cycles you have, and out of this, you get your time. So this is the, this is the ultimate limit of precision spectroscopy uh, today. And with this, they can do spectroscopy down to almost 18 uh, figures accuracy. So only an error of almost down to one part in 10 to the minus 18. So... And, and actually, that's not only the ultimate limit of 
spectroscopy, it's the ultimate limit of precision for anything we can measure. Okay, so after telling you about the limit of uh, the current limit of, of laser spectroscopy, uh, I will finish this lecture. So this is the last part of this lecture. So some of these things is of course easier to understand if you can ask questions and discuss it forward and back, which you cannot do this year, unfortunately, since we are, don't have normal lectures. But we will have a questioning hours and I highly, you are highly welcome to come and discuss all this physics with me at this questioning hours. Okay, with that I say, uh, thank you very much for listening and goodbye until then.